Hear the word of the Lord from the sixth chapter of Matthew, starting at verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And, And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? What the passage in in Matthew chapter 6 is telling us and what Christ uh, taught um, on that hillside so long long ago in in the talk we know as the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, it tells us don't worry. Okay, we know that. It tells us that life is more important than food. We know that. It tells us that we as human beings, his greatest creation, is so much worth more to him than birds. It tells us that the wild flowers of the fields are dressed even better than Solomon was in all his glory. It tells us that pagans worry after these kinds of things, but we should seek God's kingdom. That's all wrapped up in those verses, but it's much more than that. So let, let's, for the next few moments, let's peel back some of the layers and kind of take those, those onion covers off and look at below the surface as to what it means. Of course, the theme is don't worry. We know that. And it says in verse 25, don't worry about some things. Your life, don't worry about your life. It says in verse 25, don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink and your body, what you're going to wear. And in verse 28 and 31, it repeats that. Don't worry about these things. Now, Jesus, of course, is not saying ignore them. He's not saying, you know, ignore the needs of your life. He's not saying ignore the need for food. We, he knows that we need life. He knows that we need food. He knows that we need clothing. But I would argue this morning that he may be telling us in this passage, don't be paralyzed with fear over these things. Don't don't be wringing our hands wondering how these things are going to come to pass. Don't Don't be preoccupied with these things. Don't be focused on these things over things that are more important. In fact, there's a lot of negatives here, isn't there? Do not worry about this. Do not do this. But the Bible also says in this passage what we are to do. Let's look at the positive here. What should we do instead? Well, instead, verse 26 says, look. At the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and your heavenly Father feeds them. Verse 28 says, see how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or they don't spin. He says, look and see. Why are we to consider these things that are so temporal? Because these things, the flowers of the fields and the birds, they they don't do anything for us, do they? They're, they're, They're just there. They're just there, and we enjoy them. The, the sea that we, we enjoy that's so close to us here, we enjoy the sea, the air, the sun, the stars. In fact, we miss the sun when it's not here sometimes, and we're thankful that it's here most of the time. They are just there. They're not doing anything. They're not trying to survive. They're, they're just there. But, but look how these things make our lives so much more, more joyable, so much more happy. The, the flowers beautify the earth. The birds of the air, they, they, they chirp and they make noise and they, 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 they share God's love. I was hearing this morning that, that someone, I think, saw something on the news about in the north, they're starting to hear birds. 
That's a good thing because the birds have been silent for so long and spring is coming and the chirping of the birds is starting to be heard. I mean, in our neighborhood, I, I love the ducks that are in a pond behind our house. Sometimes they block my driveway. And I can't get out. And I have to wait for the ducks. But it's fun because life around us gives us joy, doesn't it? And, and the birds' songs give us joy. And sitting on the beach watching the surf gives many of us joy. It gives us a sense of peace, a sense of tranquility. The Bible says, look at the birds and see the flowers of the field. Nature does what God intends nature to do. It's just there. Genesis 1.26 kind of puts it in its place. It says in 1.26, God says, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. In the early church, Scripture was taught through catechism, and some of you have memorized catechism, and our children uh, went to a, a, a classical Christian school that taught the Protestant catechism. It's a verbal way of teaching the scriptures that involves questions and answers, and, and the, the, the teacher presents the question, and the student memorizes the answers and gives those answers back, and that's how people learn about the scriptures many years ago. The first question in the Protestant catechism is this, what is the chief end of man? Or what is the chief purpose of man? And the answer to that, some of you are nodding, the answer is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. What's the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him together. The answer is not to serve God. The answer is not to be useful to others. The answer is not to help others. All good things. But according to this teaching, that's not the chief or the main purpose of man, but that purpose is to enjoy God and glorify him. And, and sometimes in our, in our busy world, sometimes we may fall into the temptation of thinking that the chief purpose is to do stuff for God. Good stuff. You may, and you and I may be working to be useful for him. Good things. Our goal in life may be to do good, and those are good things. We may start each day with the question, God, what good can I do for you today? Good things. However, like the birds and the flowers, I would suggest today that maybe sometimes we are just to be. And to focus on God himself and maybe not how useful you and I can be to him. My mind, as yours probably right now, goes to the story of Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10. You know the story. Martha was doing what she's supposed to do. She's getting the house ready when Jesus and his buds came for, for a meal one night. And, and Mary sat at the foot of Jesus listening to him. And, and the Bible says in verse 40, Luke 10, 40 says this, very intentional. Martha was distracted by the preparations. Interesting word, isn't it? It didn't say Martha was, was preparing to serve them. She was distracted by the preparations. The meal preparations were important. Of course they were. But not as important as what Mary was doing and just being there at his feet. And Jesus says to Martha, Martha, you are worried. And you're upset about many things. But Mary has chosen what is better. It's between good and and better. Martha was, was paralyzed in fear in some respect. She was worried. She, was, she said to Mary, come on, help me now, please. You know, good thing she was doing. But she was distracted by the work and forgot in that moment to just be there and enjoy being with Christ. I would suggest that Matthew 6.25 could very easily be read this way. Do not be preoccupied about being of use to others. Simply believe on me. And, and when we simply be, when we simply believe on him and worship him and joy, enjoy him and glorify him, then we will become useful to him. Of course. We'll be a blessing to other people. We'll be serving him, but it will be out of an a, a, a ambition to follow him and to worship him and to enjoy him. If our attention is on the source that the scripture tells us in John 7, that streams of living water will flow out from us, will be the result of us being there 
in his presence. And if we simply concentrate and focus our lives on being with him, on loving him, on giving him glory, then others will be blessed by God through us. But only if our attention is on him and not our attention on our usefulness. And isn't it true that God in his mercy many times often doesn't let you know what a blessing you are to people because he knows how pride can get in the way. Now, many of us practice the spiritual disciplines, prayer, meditation, fasting, study of God's word, living a simple life, confession, all good things. But if our goal is simply to check these off a list and we say to ourselves, if I do these things, then I'll be what we call a good Christian. Instead of using these as the only, the only way to use these is to get closer to the Lord, then our focus might be off-center as to perhaps what it should be. If doing these spiritual disciplines is only to, to become a better person, then as 1 Corinthians 13 reminds us, they're no more than the sound of a gong or a clanging cymbal, making noise, but to nobody's benefit. A seminary teacher uh, commenting on his students after they finished their seminary training, he said these words. He says, my students have graduated in love with the scriptures. But they love the scriptures more than they love the God of the scriptures. Because the students love studying the scriptures. The students loved analyzing various interpretations of the scriptures. The students love to go back into the original languages and interpret. They love preaching the scriptures, but somehow the God of the scriptures kind of drained out. And the emphasis was on the words and not the source. As faithful Christians as you and I are, sometimes I think we're tempted to fall in love with the church to fall in love with our church and, and the fellowship which we have here, which is rich. And the various ministers of our core here, which are varied. And the opportunities of service here, which are many. And many of you are involved in that, and God bless you for doing that. And everything that happens in our community, they're all good things, but I pray this morning that in enjoying our fellowship together, enjoying our church, that we don't accidentally let God slip out of that and forget to worship him and glorify him. Oswald Chambers says these words. He says, growth in our spiritual life comes not from focusing directly on it, but from concentrating on our Father in heaven. Our heavenly Father knows our circumstances, and if we will stay focused on him instead of our circumstances, we will grow spiritually. I'm going to try an experiment here for you. Uh, Major, if you put, put that up on the, on the wall for me. Um, if you would do me a favor and, and count, see if you can count the number of black dots you see on the screen. Why can't we count the black dots? Every time we look at them, they disappear, don't they? And, and we can see the black dots if we don't focus on them. The black dots are only seen by not focusing on them. If we focus on them, what happens? They disappear. Our focus needs to be on the Lord. Now, Major, take that down because I'm going to lose attention to all, all, everything. If I, if I keep up, I know it. I, I know us. I know, I know you, you know. If our lives focus on being good, if our lives focus on being useful for God, if our lives focus on doing good for him, we may just miss him. Think of someone you know who has had a great influence on you. Put that person's mind in your face, in your mind. Put the person's face in your mind. Is that because that person said wise things to you? Perhaps, but perhaps not. I would suggest this morning that that person has had an influence on you because of the life they lead. Because of the simple and untarnished Life they lead because of God's word. Just living and walking with Jesus was an influence on you and me. These are the people that make a difference in our lives. You probably have heard the statement by Ralph Waldo Emerson that says, what you speak so loudly, I cannot hear what you say. We've heard that. Well, there's scientific evidence to support that. 
When you meet someone for the first time, only 7% of what they say comes to you. It, 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 makes, it has an effect on you. 35, 38% of your opinion of them is based upon their tone of voice. And 55% is based upon body language. What you do speak so loudly I cannot hear what you say. We may be saying all the right things, but if our actions don't back them up, then our words don't mean a whole lot. So where is our focus this morning? Is our focus this morning on doing the right things, on, on being a ministry to others, on touching others' lives, all good things? Or is our focus on living for the right person? Matthew 6, going back to our text, says, listen, what am I going to eat? The thing, things that it talks about, what am I going to wear? What am I going to drink? These are all true things that we should take care of. But the questions that, that we, we, we may also ask ourselves is, what can I do to be good enough? Implicit in here is, how can I be a blessing to people? Or how can I be seen as a godly person? And God's answer is found in verses 32 and 33 of this passage. It says, the pagans run after these things. Your heavenly Father knows you need them, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Instead of worrying, instead of being preoccupied with the stuff of life, instead of being paralyzed with fear, worrying about these things, Scripture says, hey, look at the birds. See, it, see the flowers. They're just there. Seek God's kingdom, which is God's life as lived down here with his will. And seek God's righteousness. And everything else will fall into place if our focus is in the right place. This morning our question for all of us is, where is our focus? Where is our preoccupation are we wringing our hands? Are we paralyzed with fear, worrying about food or clothing or reputation or earthly treasures like we talked about last week? Fill in the blank for yourself. You know yourself. Good things. Good things. Or are we focused primarily on Jesus, on him, on being for him, on his kingdom lived out through our lives? I pray this morning our mind is set on him and the other things of life that may tempt us to focus toward them, will fall into place if our focus is on him. We're going to sing just a brief chorus here. It's chorus 629. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. We're going to sing this chorus a couple times. And if God is speaking to you this morning, if God says, listen, the focus might be just a little bit off, then he may say to you, you know, Coming down here is a place to get your focus right in the right place again. And if he says that to you, then do what he says. He may be speaking into your heart, or he may say to you, your focus is right on me. God bless you, and I bless you because of that. But as we sing this morning, it's a promise that thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. As we sing this, respond as the Lord would have you to respond this morning. In your own hearts, or here, or however the Lord speaks to you today. Let's just leave this place knowing our focus is on being, our focus is on glorifying Him and worshiping Him, and the other things will fall into place.
God, we strive for perfect peace in our hearts. We strive for perfect peace in our souls. And we know that that peace can only come from the Prince of Peace. You giving that peace to us as a gift. And God, when, when we live in a place of peace in our hearts, then worry cannot take over. When we focus on being with you, glorifying you, enjoying you, then worry cannot be a part of that. God, we pray this morning that if we are carrying burdens with us, that you will give us that peace. Of course there's issues in life that cause us concern. Of course. Of course there's, there's prayer needs we have. People in our, in our fellowship here have physical concerns. And of course that's, that's a fact of life, God. But we pray above all that, your peace will provide a comfort to us so that worry does not have to take over. Help us to continue to focus on you, to focus on your glory, and to focus on your peace as our mind remains stayed on you. Thank you for reminding us of this, of this uh, in, in your Sermon on the Mount. You talked to people who had worries. You said, look, they'll take care of themselves. Focus on me first, and everything else will work out. And God, we thank you for that assurance from your word this morning. For it's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen.